Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks everybody for coming today, uh, both here and I guess we got some, some uh, video links as well. Um, I'm Bill Weil and it's with great pleasure that I welcome you to Green at Google, which is our speaker series that welcomes authors to Google to talk about various environmental and sustainability topics. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our speaker, who is one of the most in remarkable environmental advocates living today. Um, he's inspired at least one, if not two or three generations of, of people um, over the last many years, including myself. Um, as I was writing this, I was, I was kind of struck by the number of parallels between our speaker's pioneering work and biography and our own Google history. I should say that I could probably spend the entire hour summarizing this biography. Um, you guys don't want me to do that. Um, so, uh, first of all, he's a Stanford graduate, you know, the place where Larry met Sergey. Um, 39 years before Google Earth was launched, he initiated a campaign which resulted in NASA releasing the first color images of Earth from space. These pictures also helped to inspire the creation of the first Earth Day celebrations. He's best known as the founder of the original Whole Earth Catalog. Some of you are probably too young to know what that is. Uh, some of us aren't. Fossil. Uh, thank you, yes, fossil. I, I'm guilty. Uh, it was likened to, and I quote, Google in paperback form. I don't think that was said, you know, in the 60s, but more recently. And he received a National Book Award for it. He was the original organizer of the Hacker Conference, popularizing the famous phrase, information wants to be free, uh, an idea which continues to become even more popular today, and certainly resonates with our mission to make the world's information easily and universally accessible and, and useful. He also co-founded The Well, another thing that many uh, of you are probably too young to know about, um, with Larry Brilliant, who was an executive director of Google.org for several years. It was one of the first and longest lasting online communities and, and really paved the way in, in many ways for every online business, business from Amazon to eBay to Google and, and so on. Um, Stuart is a self-proclaimed environmental heretic, so he's not afraid to challenge the status quo. He's here today to talk about his latest book, Polar Discipline, an Eco-Pragmatist Manifesto, a book which has been hailed as one of the most important books of the decade, as well as ominous and exhilarating and mind-bending. I hope you'll find his ideas engaging and provocative as well. Please join me in welcoming Stuart Frank. All right, how's our sound? Are we okay all the way back and stuff like that? Okay, great, good to go. One, one other point of order. Um, sorry. So this is being recorded. We'll be put on YouTube. So when you ask questions, please remember that, that this is public. This is not a private Google talk. And there is my... I wonder what things you don't say. So you can't we can't tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, quick wee visit. At age of 10, I gave my pledge as an American to save and faithfully to defend from waste the natural resources of my country of air, soil, and minerals, and forests, waters, and wildlife. Uh, that came from not some kind of lefty thing, but outdoor life. Uh, conservation pledge was promoted by uh, conservatives, basically hunters and fishermen. And it's well to remember that the environmental movement was basically begun in this country by duck hunters. And it has been a conservative thing from the start, and it's only lately got identified, I think over-identified with being on the left. So I went to Stanford, got my degree in ecology, did the whole of the catalog 68, and in the 70s I worked for the first Jerry Brown administration. <laughs> <laughs> and he, <clears throat> that administration set in motion the regulations and rules and norms so that Californians emit half the greenhouse gases of the residents in any other state per capita. Uh, that lasted through several Republican governors and it's an impressive accomplishment. So the current event for me is uh, this book called Whole Earth Discipline. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of things that are in it that I won't touch on much today. I'm trying to move on thinking from the idea of natural capital is a way to think about ecosystem services and just say, look, it's infrastructure. Yeah, it's natural infrastructure, but a bridge is infrastructure, so is the river under. Um, the cautionary principle is fine if and only if it allows things to go forward and be tried. So I want the precautionary principle matched with the vigilance principle where you keep an eye on stuff. 
You try it, and then out of precaution, you watch if it's going to do good things or bad things. It's particularly nice to be talking here at Google because the Rethinking Green I'm doing basically is trying to get the whole environmental movement and everybody who listens to them to think like scientists and even more to think like engineers. That is not always saying no to things, but often saying yes, and let's do it this particularly cool way. That involves thinking like a fox instead of a hedgehog, being able to hold many things, many ideas, some of them contradictory in your mind at the same time, instead of pledging your entire life and allegiance to one hedgehoggy ideology. So I'm trying to move people from romance to science to engineering. And we're realizing that we are now the keystone species on the planet. And uh, it is basically ours to guard either well or badly, but we don't have a choice not to. The news items in the book, and the ones that are maybe more directly relevant here and easier and more fun to illustrate, is cities are green, nuclear power is green, genetic engineering is green, and I fear that geoengineering may well be necessary. Uh, let's quickly visit the climate aspects of that. I won't go through the whole trip that I'm sure Al Gore did on the climate, but the point that interests me most about it is to the degree to which it is a severe nonlinear system with various hidden positive feedbacks, tipping points, thresholds, and whatnot. This is just one diagram that climatologists use to remind themselves of the things that we don't know yet. So there's a hell of a lot more science that needs to come along in all these subjects. What happens when climate really affects things is with warming, you get drought. With drought, you get a fight over lowering carrying capacity for for humans, over resources, over water, in the case of Darfur. Uh, if things go badly with climate, Darfur may be seen as the first of the climate wars. A good book on this sort of subject is called Constant Battles by Stephen LeBlanc. Another potential conflict area is the glaciers of the Himalaya. No, they're probably not going to all melt by 2035, as we heard from the IPCC, but they are nevertheless melting. And the entire Himalayan plateau feeds rivers that provide water in the dry season to 40% of humanity. Most of those rivers flow through several different nations, several of which are nuclear armed. If they get to fighting over resources, it could get pretty ugly. Uh, a couple of good climate books. This is interesting. Uh, this is such a green presentation that all my colors have gone green. <laughs> there really are other colors in the original. It's kind of fun. It's a little sickly, I'd have to say. Anyway, a couple books I recommend is James Lovelock, Vanishing Face of Gaia, and Six Degrees by Mark Linus. With this group of engineers, I will uh, raise a question that is I don't usually raise in public, which is there may be hidden negative feedbacks, we hope so, in the climate system. There may be a flywheel of momentum effect that slows down some of these tipping points and positive feedbacks. There is still carbon disappearing from the atmosphere that we don't know where it's going. Mysterious carbon sink. It may be going in the oceans, it may be going in the soil, it may be going in the trees growing because of CO2, but we, would, we need to figure out what that is and either at least work with it or not hinder it. Lots of science. Likewise, another possible uh, positive feedback. A whole lot of the book goes on about microorganisms, our best friend, because they create the atmosphere that we live with. There's a uh, microorganism in the oceans called Emiliana huxleyi, e hux to his friends, uh, that makes blooms you can see from space. They increase the reflectance of the earth when they do that. They fix carbon in their shells. The shells then sink to the bottom of the ocean, and they are a carbon fixer. And there's some sign with lab work that they may not mind acidification of the oceans. Lots more science needed there. So moving from uh, climate to the whole Earth perspective on demographics, the major factor I'm trying to get everybody who's thinking about these issues, climate and green issues and so on, is that five out of six of us do not live in the developed world. We live in the developing world where a whole hell of a lot is going on. People are moving to cities, they're educating their kids, they're getting the hell out of poverty. And uh, it is a demographic change as large as any in the history of humanity, 
going on now. We've now passed the majority of people living on the Earth, urban cities, so I call it city planet. And the, the expectation is that by about mid-century, we will up, be up to 80% urban, which is what it is in developed countries now. Uh, the overall numbers are incredible, 1.3 million new people a week in cities, 70 million a year. Some are being born there, most are moving there. And when they move, they move from, primarily from subsistence agriculture situations, uh, which are beautiful to look at, but they're hell to work in. Uh, they are poverty traps, they're ecological disasters, because typically it's on marginal land. When people move off this land, especially in the tropical areas, it grows back very fast. The animals come back, it's no longer being killed for bush meat. And this is a uh, part of the green advantage of cities. That's in the developing world. In the developed world, as we're increasingly finding, cities are the big place to live if you want to use less materials, less energy, and by the way, have a more exciting life. So people are moving away from the poverty trap, but they're moving toward action. Now, they don't get to go to downtown Manhattan right away. They start with squatter cities, with slums. And there is no end of economic activity going on there, in the informal economy, as it's called. I talked about this a couple of years ago at Google, so I won't go into great uh, depth about it, but a good book on the subject is Shadow Cities around the North. Important point to realize is, is that people are getting out of poverty. Part of what they're doing is they're moving to the bright lights of cities. They want electricity. If it's not there, really available, they don't have money to pay for it, they steal it. Like here in Favela and Rio. They do the same with water, cable TV, and by and by, things go well enough, gradually it gentrifies, and these things become legal. But it starts out illegal. Squatter cities are the densest social capital activities in the world. Look at an edge like this in Sao Paulo, and you start to see why cities drive so much of their power from proximity. In this case, you've got people that live on the left in the uh, boring part of town, uh, walk to work over in the, in the exciting part of town on the left, and over the boring uh, empty swimming pools on the right, as nannies and gardeners and gardens and cooks and whatnot, and then walk home to uh, the interesting life on the left. Proximity is everything in cities. It is what drives people to them, it's what rewards them for being there. So here you have a uh, sort of national scale train moving through a dense slum market in Bangkok. And these kinds of proximities are drivers of innovation. They're drivers of economic activity. And one of the reasons we all move to cities is because every now and then we get surprised. I love showing this to city planners and just <laughs> and real estate guys. You know, where do you begin? <laughs> the poor people of the world are the slums and the squatter cities are the greenest people there are. They use the least energy and the least materials. But they're that green because they're poor and they do not choose to remain that poor. Uh, this particular guy told the photographer, a fellow named Lachman Kumbi, for toilet purposes we have to go outside. This is in the Dowerby slum in Mumbai. It's a problem, we have to go on the road. The electricity is on for two days, then off two days, we're not on at all. We don't have much space for the children to play in. They use the road to play, and accidents take place again and again. I'm not studied at all, and in the literate. For work, I stitch government jeans and pants. It's fine, but the workday ends late. I want to educate my kids. Until the day I die, I'll educate them. As long as I'm around, that's guaranteed. That's the world changing event. The kids getting educated in cities, fewer of them, typically the birth rate drops below 2.1 per woman as soon as they get into town. And that combination is changing the world. So what we're looking at <clears throat> over the next 30 years is the global south full of huge growing cities, new cities full of young people, and here in the north, basically old cities, increasingly full of people who look like me. Old people. And where do you think the action's going to be? 
because all the cities in the world want to get to this state, which is not usually green. It's usually beautiful golden yellow. Um, cities require base load power. And to get to the power issue, uh, right now we get base load electricity from just three sources, mostly coal and gas, uh, some hydro, some nuclear. In terms of constant base load, there is, as far, so far, no other source. We hope to get mass storage for solar for wind, but they don't, they're not online yet. From the green standpoint, the main argument for nuclear is when you compare what happens with the, base, the waste products. That beautiful non-red Coke can uh, would contain uh, a lifetime's worth of spent fuel from nuclear electricity. Whereas just one day in a normal one gigawatt coal-fired plant, you see 19,000 tons of carbon dioxide coming out, along with no end of slurry and flash and the rest of it. Where does the waste go? From nuclear waste, the 20 tons of fuel becomes 20 tons of waste, goes into two dry calf storage up back in the parking lot. 2.9 million tons of coal turns into 8 million tons of carbon dioxide, which goes into everybody's atmosphere where we can't do anything about it. So when you compare the lifetime greenhouse gas emissions of nuclear, it's down there with hydro and wind and, and still ahead of solar. Just a thing or two to say about wind. Uh, it's pretty major infrastructure by now. And it takes uh, not just an ecological footprint on the land, but a physical footprint on the industrialized landscape uh, to the point of one gigawatt, which isn't constant, uh, taking up about 250 square miles of industrialized land. Solar is even tougher here in California. You take a pretty place out in the desert and uh, bulldoze it for solar farms, and one gigawatt uh, takes 50 square miles. And just in case you think that's a particularly pretty or spectacular parkish place in the desert, there's, of course, a Google indicator of where the photograph was taken. It's an ordinary spot that is exactly the kind of places that are being dozed for solar farms. But nothing against solar or wind. Um, but we're, as environmentalists, starting to learn the trade-off. Saul Griffith uh, has gone through the numbers and figured out that to really stabilize the planet, we need 13 terawatts of new clean energy. And if you parse all of that out uh, to what it would take to do it, you get things like 30,000 square miles of solar electric panels, 15,000 square miles for another two terawatts of solar thermal panels. And on down the line, it still only comes to 10, so we threw in three terawatts of nuclear for 3,900 one gigawatt reactors. You add it all up, and it takes an area about the size of North America, which Saul calls for newest dam. <laughs> Uh, a really good book on this subject is uh, David Mackay's uh, basically doing the math on what it would take to make England green. And one of the things he says, uh, look, I'm not trying to be in favor of nuclear, but I am in favor of arithmetic. <laughs> so everybody says, what about Chernobyl? Okay, uh, Chernobyl is interesting. You go back there later, and what you find now is it's the world's best, or Europe's best wildlife refuge. Uh, one zoologist who went there studied the animals on the ground for 10 years and said that it was very interesting that the world's worst nuclear reactor uh, disaster was nowhere as harmful for, for the wildlife as just what people do ordinarily, farming and so on. When people moved out of Pripyat, it's reforested. So my expectation is that within this decade, you'll see Chernobyl National Park, and we'll all go there to see the animals and to see the terrible signs of the terrible thing that happened. Proliferation is another famous issue, and uh, this is red, white, and blue. <laughs> and it's uh, megatons. I guess they really didn't want to call it megadeaths to megawatts, but 10% um, of American electricity comes from uh, recycled Russian warheads. We haven't even started on our own stockpile yet. It is one of the good reasons to move ahead with with shutting down all of the nuclear weapons in the world, because unlike most weapon systems, this is actually valuable. You downblend the weapons-grade uranium into fuel, uh, you can run a hell of a lot of electricity. I think it's wonderful that the very bombs that were targeted at blowing up American cities are now being used to light up American cities is uh, exquisite. 
Now, the big question is nuclear waste. What do we do with that? Well, it's not going to Yucca Mountain. Uh, where it stands now is in broadcast storage in the various reactor sites in the U.S. and around the world. It's perfectly fine there for 50 or 100 or 150 years while we think about what we want to do with it. Uh, it may well be fuel for the next generation of reactors, or it could just go in the ground if we wanted to, where nuclear waste has been going for 10 years in New Mexico in the uh, waste isolation pilot plant, uh, which is pretty cool to visit and they uh, occasionally welcome visitors. The argument for the WIP is that that salt formation has been there for 250 million years. It's not going anywhere. Water doesn't come in or out of it. You're down half a mile. And uh, it's about as good a place as any to stash stuff that you really want to forget about. A good book on nuclear is uh, one of Craven's power to save the world. I figured this group would want to see how we think about transporting nuclear uh, waste. Containers have been loaded onto a truck that was crashed first at 60 miles per hour and then at 80 miles per hour into a 700 ton concrete wall. They have been broadsided by a 120 ton locomotive traveling at 80 miles per hour. Another physical test involved dropping containers in a 30 foot free fall onto steel reinforced concrete comparable to hitting a concrete slab head-on at 120 miles an hour. They've been dropped onto a six-inch diameter spike, and the containers have been burned in a pool of aviation fuel for 90 minutes at temperatures of more than 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The result in each case, there were no ruptures or significant damage to the used fuel containers themselves. Although dented and charred, the containers remained totally intact to protect the used fuel they would carry. See the amount of fun the mechanical engineers can have? <laughs> I think it's useful to think of, of nuclear not just in terms of um, that it puts out less greenhouse gases, but there are various positive things that can happen with the next generation, with the fast reactors and some of the other hotter burning reactors. So you can go from what we have with Diablo Canyon now to, uh, yeah, electricity from there should go into plug-in hybrids, then it's clean. It's not so if it comes from coal or gas. Um, the hot reactors could, can be used directly for generating hydrogen and for desalinating water, for fresh water. Uh, they can also take that spent fuel and uh, turn it back into fuel so that the stuff we were worried about putting in Yucca Mountain can be just put into the, the fourth generation reactors and put to work. And of course there's no carbon dioxide uh, worth mentioning that comes out of this. One of the elements that I'm most interested in is, is the new uh, domain of down on the lower left of the so-called small modular reactors, the SMRs, 25 megawatts and stuff like that. Here's one from Toshiba, super safe, small and simple. Um, the Russians are leading the way on this one. They've got one that they're building now uh, for use along the Northern Sea Passage because the ice is melting north of Russia and the, uh, it's opening up for shipping. They're pouring concrete for ports. They need power for the ports. They're making these floating 35 megawatt reactors and are also planning to sell them in the developing world for uh, coastal countries. Uh, here's a local design from uh, Lawrence Livermore, a commercial design from New Mexico, Hyperion, uh, supposedly ready now, they're getting sales, new scale in Oregon. These are all typically buried in the ground. They are modular in the sense they're built at a factory instead of on site and you know, trucked to the spot, put in the ground, treated as, quote, nuclear batteries, relatively few moving parts, proliferation proof, safe, all that good stuff. Even uh, one of the oldest players, Babcock and Wilcox, uh, his, they're the ones who build the reactors for the Navy has come out with a new 125 megawatt reactor. They say they have three utilities want to purchase it. Um, here's uh, basically a concept for a fourth generation reactor that's small, 100 megawatts. Uh, this integral fast reactor potentially could, for a small town, besides providing local electricity, also desalinate water locally, provide hydrogen locally if that turns out to be useful. There's many people who Google who love thorium. Um, <laughs> The uh, outfit that Nathan Merval does in Electrical Ventures is uh, working with Lowell Wood. They've got a thorium design that is a uh, true bury and forget. It says you put it in the ground, run it for 60 years, and then just leave it there. The nature of the waste is perfectly comfortable in that spot. Now, will the Google 
goal of having some form of clean energy is cheaper than coal come along. I don't know. I don't know if it'll be nuclear. I don't know <clears throat> what it might be. But in the meantime, uh, it's probably important that governments that we hire to think long term and deal with infrastructure make coal expensive so that the market and everything else can move ahead and making these other things move forward and get cheap enough. Basically, if the, if the governments in Europe, the United States, China, and India all make coal expensive, we're probably in a pretty good shape for greenhouse gases. And if they don't, it's going to be difficult. One other quick subject, good old genetically modified organisms, genetically engineered food crops, uh, for some reason, my fellow environmentalists uh, became deeply averse to it, frank and true. And it was based on, I think, ignorance that the notion that if you take genes from one species and put them in another species, there's something profoundly unnatural about that. Uh, it's not unnatural to a microorganism. They've been doing it for 3.5 billion years. It's how a great deal of evolution has occurred by uh, translation of genes from one organism to the next. We're just finally picking up on that technology. We call it a form of biomimicry. One of the things they ask with, I love that poisonous green color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay, who's actually using this? Well, the Amish, for one. We're usually <laughs> very suspicious of any new technology, but they are also some of the best farmers in America. They see no good seeds when they see it. They were one of the early adopters of BT corn, for example. Likewise, all around the world, it's been picked up by many of the developing countries, such as South Africa, where engineered uh, white maize is one of the most popular food crops there. Just three books I'll quickly recommend here, Gordon Conway's The Doubly Green Revolution. Uh, two local folks, the uh, tomorrow's table, Pamela Ronald is a genetic engineer at UC Davis, married to an organic farming teacher named Raul Adamchak, they think the combination of organic and uh, engineered is the ideal way to go with agriculture, and I have to agree. Uh, a good survey of the area is uh, Nina Fedorov's Mendel in the Kitchen. This is the most successful agricultural revolution in history, basically. It's taken off so rapidly. And my fellow environmentalists keep saying that it's somehow bad for farmers, but the farmers haven't gotten that message. They think these are better seeds. They like plants that they can get ahead of the weeds with, that they can get ahead of the pests with, and that doesn't do a lot of damage to the landscape. Uh, so in the case of soybeans, for example, um, most of the world's soybeans now are, are herbicide tolerant. That means that you don't have to plow the ground to keep the weeds down. No-till agriculture is absolutely one of the best things you can do ecologically, and it's a direct result of genetic engineering. As for the moral and ethical issues, the Newfield Council on Bioethics in England uh, explored this subject twice in great depth and came up with the uh, conclusion that it's a moral imperative for making GM crops readily and economically available to anybody in the developing world that wants it. Now, this is not just for the developing world. Yeah, there are a number of things that are being done for especially tropical plants that have not been bred up to their full capabilities. And so you have some fairly lousy food like cassava, which is good for starch but not much else, that 800 million people live on, or sorghum, that 500 million people live on. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation put money into BioCassava Plus. It has improved eight ways, including reducing the damn cyanide uh, that is natural in the plant. Uh, down on the uh, lower end of the scale, you see things that are going to be of great interest to us, such as uh, not only an allergy-free peanut, but uh, a pig with omega-3 fatty acids in it. So it's, it's a healthy for you, for your nervous system, your heart is eating a wild fish, and it would be fine with me if you didn't eat a wild fish and eat a pig instead, or even better, uh, there's a soybean that has this capability coming along from everybody's uh, favorite enemy, Monsanto. They're finally doing uh, some crops that are going to be nutritious. And increasingly, there will be medical uh, benefits as well in some of these engineered foods. The engineering standpoint on this is that Rob Carlson, the Carlson curve, is pointing out that even though recombinant DNA technology, standard genetic engineering, has been 
increasing its capabilities at a faster than Moore's law rate, the new capabilities of synthetic biology, that is of basically generating um, new genomes somewhat from scratch, that's moving even faster than that. In other words, this is a technology which is going to increasingly dominate everything, including all the environmental issues we're interested in. This is a generational thing. So Drew Wendy over here at Stanford is uh, bending the mind of children with comics that invite them to uh, get some of this stuff. And just like the Rector sets and chemistry sets and Heath Kit sets of long ago, these are now biotech sets where the kids can make new forms of life in the basement. And then they uh, convene, the ones that are in colleges and form teams, they get together and compete at MIT uh, every September at the iGEM meetings. And uh, what are they up to now? 100 teams from 26 countries. Uh, this is an amazing occasion. And of course, a lot of it is frivolous. Uh, bacteria that do the wave. Uh, they smell different in different parts of their uh, uh, cycle of life. But at the same time, they've come up with things like a, uh, a very cheap biotech sensor for pollution in streams. I just threw in here a picture which is uh, accurate because that is a blue rose. Uh, the thing which has been tried to be created by breeding low these many years, everybody failed. And the Japanese, uh, the Suntory, came up with a blue rose they call applause. They borrow a couple of genes from pansies and petunias. Uh, that is not a pansy or petunia, it's a rose, and for $30 a stem, you can buy one. <laughs> one of the pleasures of working on this book is I got to revisit ecology 50 years after studying it. A lot has changed. One of the things that's come along is uh, this term called ecosystem engineering. It's the sort of thing that earthworms do beneficially. Basically, in the process of making the soil better for earthworms, it makes the soil better for everybody, including farmers. Uh, likewise, beavers famously uh, make ponds, which then make habitat, ecotones, and all the rest of it, and multiply the diversity in any area that they're permitted to do that. This is one of the reasons that bringing the wolves back to Yellowstone was so great, because the wolves ate the, uh, scared enough of the elk that the elk got out of the riparian area, stopped eating all the trees. Uh, the beavers came back, since there were trees, started damming creeks, and the biodiversity of those parts of Yellowstone jumped immediately. One of the great inspirers for me and other Greens is uh, Aldo Leopold. Uh, he basically inspired people to become ecosystem engineers by restoring natural systems. And then he showed how it could be done with his own shack in Wisconsin, uh, in Sand County, where he took a really frapped out farm, planted a bunch of trees, and lo, a few years later, the forest was back. He undid damage on 150 acres. We're looking at having to undo damage on planet scale. And that's going to get hairy, because here's why. We're realizing that we may not get through the easy ways to head off greenhouse gases and climate change. Mitigation uh, may not succeed soon enough. We see things like uh, what happened in Copenhagen, and that's pretty depressing. Uh, we keep getting more bad news than good news from climate science. One still hopes that there's going to be something that shows there's a deep, stable uh, capability there, but that is yet to emerge. And then as people start looking at geoengineering, uh, the realization is that it is shockingly cheap. Uh, for example, sometimes it's free. <laughs> This was Mount Pinatubo in 1991. It sent uh, 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide, volcanic ash, into the stratosphere, which uh, James Hansen predicted would cool down the planet by half a degree Celsius. And lo and behold, next year it was cooled by half a degree Celsius. There was more ice in the Arctic, which meant more polar bears, and the biologists called the cubs the Pinatubo cubs. So this is the one that the climatologists think, well, if volcanoes can do it, we can do it. And, uh, uh, of course, Nathan and the intellectual ventures guy wanted to guys wanted to get into this. They came up with the notion of uh, blimp-supported hoses that would carry up 100,000 tons a year of sulfur dioxide. They figured 3 million tons a year would do it. If you could do it every year, that would be enough to cool the planet basically 3 degrees Celsius, head off a doubling of CO2 if needed. And I think they lowballed the price at 300 million a year. 
but compare that to the cost of mitigation and, and think about the attractions of doing this sort of thing when things get really hairy. Now there's uh, yet other very cool ideas. This one, uh, that's Stephen Salter, the English engineer designing Flettner uh, sails for a ship that would be uh, robot controlled and satellite guided that would course up and down, atomizing seawater, putting the atomized seawater up so it dries out immediately, makes a little salt crystal, which then becomes the core of a water droplet, which goes up and joins the ocean clouds and makes them brighter, thereby brightening the whole damn planet, or at least that part of the oceans, uh, by whatever degree you want to make it. There are so many things to do with the science in this. There's two whole branches of this. I've been to some of the meetings. There's you know, the engineering, how the hell do we actually do it? There's a bunch of retired uh, Silicon Valley engineers who are looking at this thing as a very large inkjet printer. <laughs> <laughs> well, with them are atmospheric physicists and others saying, well, just a damn minute, we don't know a whole lot of stuff, like how many particles does it take to actually make clouds, what size are the clouds really like, and by the way, how do clouds actually work with, it, with the climate? And we don't know that yet, so there's <laughs> lots to do. One that everybody sort of feels good about, remains to be seen if it will really play out, is biochar, that is pyrolyzing, uh, smoldering uh, agricultural waste, turning it into charcoal, which is a tremendously stable molecule. And uh, at least in the Amazon, the way the Indians did it, it stayed in the ground for 4,000 years. It may be a way to fix carbon in a large scale. And uh, in marginal soil, it becomes much better soil. You can amend it with this stuff. So this all adds up to um, what Paul Crutzen is calling the Anthropocene. We are now in a geological era where we've ended the Holocene. Uh, the Anthropocene is when humans are affecting things that are visible on a geological scale, things we're doing with the atmosphere, maybe with us for tens of thousands of years. And so we are terraforming Earth. And if we're going to terraform it, uh, badly, that is terrible. We don't have a choice at this point with 6.8 billion people to not terraform. So our only choice is to terraform well, hence the realization that we're, this time we're as gods and have to get good at it. I think we're shifting toward pragmatism. The way I would sum it up is to say that ecological balance is too important for sentiment and requires science. The health Health of natural infrastructure is too compromised for passivity. It requires engineering. What we call natural and what we call human are inseparable. We live one life. Thank you. There's a slide that will come up automatically with some of the book references if you want to look any of this stuff up. And I would uh, point you that the SB Notes uh, link on the right uh, gets you to the augmented, illustrated, up updated online version of the book, which uh, only a few people know about. But if you like the book, you'll find that all the sources are there with live links and lots of other things I've stolen from all over the web thanks to uh, Google Images. <laughs> So we have, time, we have time for some questions. Please come up and use the mic. Uh, and when we're done with Q&A, then I believe we have a number of copies of Stuart's book that will be signed. So here's the mic. Well, while we're waiting for one, I'll, so, so one of the issues certainly that we've been paying a lot of attention to here is the cost of clean energy. Um, what can you say about the cost in particular of nuclear? and whether uh, we can afford to deploy it at the massive scale that would be needed to, to, to get the mitigation that we need. This is one of the reasons I like the small modular reactors, is the sticker shock of building a 1.6 gigawatt machine for multi-billions of dollars um, is now answered. And Al Gore likes to say that nuclear power comes in only one size, extra large, and uh, that has been the case, but it is no longer increasingly the case with you know, down to 25 megawatts is one small town, one reactor. The advantages on that are that you don't have a huge capital cost to get really going. Because these things are modular, they're built to work in a uh, series so you can, uh, if you like the one, uh, get another, get another. And uh, the whole process becomes of 
a much more manageable scale. And, uh, and the other great advantage is if you can have it locally, that means you're not dependent on the problems of the grid, which is famously where all the breakdowns occur. You get more resilience in the grid. Uh, you shortcut the 20% or so losses that you have running your electricity long distances like with wind and so on. So that's the story. I see we've got a lot of questions. So next. Yeah. Uh, one of your closing quotes had to do having, sorry? having less emotion and, and getting more scientific about this. But uh, it seems like part of the challenge. Yeah, I'll dial is, back the emotion next time. So. Right. You know, part of the, the challenge with nuclear energy is people have very strong emotional feelings about it, uh, whether or not they're based on facts. Uh, how, how do you propose that that particular problem gets addressed? To some extent, it's, it's kind of offsetting emotions because people are getting emotional about climate. And uh, the environmentalists that I've seen change their mind, and I'm one of them, typically got brought to thinking differently about nuclear by thinking differently about the climate than they had before. Um, an example is Stephen Tyndale in England, who was head of Greenpeace UK. And you know, when he heard about the positive feedback of methane coming out of the melting permafrost, he freaked out. And it got him looking at nuclear, and it, with him, as with me, uh, he realized there was a lot more to nuclear than he thought. He started asking around his other environmentalist friends, especially the younger ones, and they were having the same, what he called, religious conversion. And uh, Stephen went all the way. He is now a paid consultant and a spokesperson for the nuclear industry. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Hi, Walker Keller. Thank you for coming. I uh, thank you for your book. Um, you had uh, contributed with the books also uh, that you recommend in your book to helping change my mind about some of the things I felt very strongly about. So thank you for that. Wow. Um, I did have one question though. Uh, as as you mentioned previously, uh, the, the number one enemy, Monsanto, uh, they have um, they're, they're driven by profits, I, I understand, as well as the, the common good. And in order Sorry, to... Sorry, you driven by profit? Uh, Monsanto and... Uh, and uh, any other companies we might... Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I preface that by saying that one of their... Um, one of the reasons why they're doing the genetic engineering is for patents on seeds. And I'm curious how we can protect farmers and other agricultural um, uh, engineers, you could say, from the problems of seeing cross-pollination and having farmers being pursued um, um, litigiously for ending up with genetically engineered products in their fields, even though they didn't start with it, just as a, a process of nature's uh, genetic engineering. So what have you? Uh, that's a great question. And first of all, I think in, in environmentalists trying to speak for farmers usually uh, is embarrassing. It should be in both parties because farmers are customers in this case. And you know, the idea that somehow uh, all these farmers are being hoodwinked and they, they need to be protected by uh, farmer spirit and environmentalists you're getting between a, a vendor and a customer there in an unnecessary way. Uh, the farmers are real good at sorting out their own uh, needs and interests. And there's, every farmer basically gets seeds from a number of different suppliers, catalogs, local uh, seed vendors, and so on. And the minute they're not happy with Monsanto, they go buy uh, seeds from someone else. And uh, even the engineering seeds are now coming from Syngenta, Dow, and DuPont. So there's real competition. I'm not so worried about that. But you raise the point of intellectual property defense, and I think Monsanto is um, <coughs> it has done things like, first of all, patenting naturally occurring genes is always, I think, a strange thing to do. Um, techniques of research that get patented and then kept away from academic researchers around the world strikes me as a real bad thing to do. And once you find the ways, you know, I would love to see environmentalists and everybody else go after them to keep that from happening very much. One advantage of patent law is that you get your 20 years and then it's over. So for example, the first Roundup Ready 
soybeans are coming out of patent this year. And uh, they're, you know, they're trying to do Roundup Ready 2 soybeans, but meanwhile, uh, the thing that they developed is out there. Roundup itself, glyphosate, came out of patent around 2000 and instantly dropped a third to a third of the price and everybody's using it now because it's such a good herbicide. So I think that Monsanto's a mixed bag. Thank you. Thanks. And I think that uh, nuclear, large-scale nuclear is not inherently expensive. Uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, they were built for inflation-adjusted prices that are cheaper than coal plants are built today. So it's, it is cheap. What really happened is there's a perverse incentive in the way we regulate utilities. We guarantee them a certain profit on their capital investment. So we shouldn't be surprised if they inflate the capital investment. If there's some kind of regulatory interference that they can address by uh, adding a new safety system that costs an extra billion dollars, and they get 10.7% guaranteed return on that investment by the CPUC, uh, they're going to not fight really, really hard to turn down the investment opportunity. I so you're right about so that. We've, we've doubled or tripled the real costs of building power plants because we've doubled and tripled the opportunity for those companies. I would assume that some developing countries will work around that. They're not dealing with the US China government. is currently building 58 or so uh, power plants at about $1.50 a watt. Uh, and numbers I hear are that there are something like 400 reactors uh, being planned for. So it, it, we don't need small nuclear power plants to solve this problem. We just need to uh, fix our regulatory process so we allow the building of big power plants for actual costs. Um, thank you. One point on the earlier question I meant to you, uh, point out is the the question of gene flow of you know what happens when uh, BT corn pollen goes over to the organic corn guy nearby and he winds up getting some of these better genes for his corn. And, and when planes were seriously just you can't sell organic anymore. Well, that is one way to think about it. But it's interesting how it played out in India. There's a book called Hybrid uh, that I just read that in the chapter toward the end said the future is Creole. And what he pointed out was when BT cotton came to India and over the most vociferous complaints of the pesticide companies who saw that there was going to be a lot less pesticide used in India. And by uh, anti-globalists like Vanda Nashiba, who said these are suicide genes, they're already on the usual. And Monsanto set up a couple of test plots of BT cotton in India, and immediately started losing some of their plants from these test plots. Quite a lot of shrinkage. And then pretty soon, suddenly there was a lot of land race cotton around that part of India and then all over India, which is caterpillar proof. Because uh, the guys had stolen the BT cotton plants, then uh, bred it with their own land-raised cotton, the local stuff, uh, which was now caterpillar proof. And that's the Creole effect. There were suddenly 50 different versions of somewhat BT land-raised cotton all over India. So, you know, is these farmers are not working against their own interests. And it is, you know, it's a kind of a squatter city sort of thing. People find their way to make stuff actually work. Yeah. Uh, um, I wanted to <clears throat> thank you for the wonderful work that you've done over the years. But uh, for today, I have a question for you since you seem to be so good at crunching the numbers. I wonder if you're familiar with Klaus Lackner's um, uh, synthetic trees. Yeah. Yeah. Have you looked at that? And do you have some analysis of whether or not that's even <clears throat> I am nowhere near competent to guess whether Klaus Leichner's uh, carbon eating trees will really work. I uh, hope they will. And by the way, I will, I will put forward a, a, another uh, carbon capture technique that Gregory Benford came up with uh, with someone else, the science fiction writer, physicist Gregory Benford. Um, he says, well, hey, you know, let's just do it quick and easy. Um, what you do is, but you take about a third of your agricultural waste from any place you're doing agriculture and take it away and it won't harm the soil. Um, and go through all this process of pyrolyzing it and the biops are Christ. Why not just bale it, put it in the truck, take it to the ocean, dump it in the ocean, bales will sink to the bottom, and the carbon will stay there for thousands of years. What about that? And you know, does it work out in terms of the cost of transportation and so on? Yeah, it does. So basically, um, 
I love that. You can just start doing it today without even a power logic, just a truck and a bailer. Imagine that. Thank you. I keep hearing very good arguments uh, for using thorium as a nuclear fuel. And you know, like ranging from uh, just to, I mean, what, the amount of waste to all sorts of uh, making of fissile fuel, fuels and arms control. And, and the availability of thorium, which is much, much larger than, uh, than uranium. On the other hand, it seems that the industry, as it stands today, it's not really looking into that. And I'm wondering if this is because they are not actually selling nuclear power and nuclear reactors, but they are selling the, uh, you know, the, the uranium fuel cycle. But that is like the... Thank you. The, there's probably many here who saw a Wired article several months ago on thorium. And there's a, a fad going for it, which I think is just great. I mean, some fads are hula hoops and some fads are jogging. You never know what it is until you hit it. <laughs> but indeed, there's supposedly three times as much thorium as there is uranium around. Uh, India, in particular, has very large quantities of thorium and, and is one here is going ahead on developing thorium reactors, which would be great. Uh, James Lovelock tells me that everybody says there's no proliferation aspect to it, um, but he says, you know, there is a, a U-235 uh, process, a lot of U-235 that, that comes out of using thorium reactors that if you were a really hardworking, inventive uh, military type, you could figure out a way to make weapons, uh, concentrate that and make weapons out of it. So it's not perfect. But guess what? <laughs> um, if something were easy and perfect, we would already have done it. So it remains to be seen how thorium plays out, but I plan it's adding to the mix. How's our time? It's just about 1 o'clock. We can close. Go? Any more questions? Okay. Well, please join me in thanking Stuart. Thank you.